Hi, Ashton. So good to have you. Thank you for coming on to the Composer class. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Sebastian. Awesome. Great. Yeah, we were just talking before um, that you're glad you're on the other side this time because you did a lot of interviews with like high profile composers and I didn't watch any of them, to be honest, yet because I just didn't have the time. But um, tell me a little bit about the, the, um, how this came about. Why, why did you do these interviews with these composers? So I started out doing interviews with composers back in 2017. Uh, I founded a group called the Global Composers Network. And through mm -hmm. that sort of community of composers, we started a YouTube channel. And so the first interview I think I did was, was Benjamin Walfish, who at the time had just released the score for It Chapter One and also Blade Runner 2049. So it was a really great time to speak with him. And um, mm -hmm. it was funny because when I was at Remote Control, um, where Ben used to work, he's since moved to a different studio, but I saw Ben and he goes, hey, you're the, you're the person that made, that did that interview with me. And so it's, it's funny how those things come full circle like that. But yeah. So I did the interview with Ben and then over the years, I've just continued to do that. And in 2019, I transitioned, um, still doing scoring work. Um, but of course I transitioned into doing documentary film as well. Um, so making films and, you know, for the last project I did, I interviewed a hundred people around the country, just traveling around and, and speaking with people. And of course, for every interview I prepped and by reading their books and, and doing all the research and looking into the history. So yeah, that's why I said beforehand, it's like, oh, it's, it's nice to be <laughs> on the other awesome. end, but really a pleasure to be yeah. here with you. Oh, awesome. Great. Um, so, I mean, you, I, I read to you, through your bio and um, all the things that you have accomplished with just, is that right? 22 years old, 23? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's impressive, man. Great. I mean, you, have, you, you started before you came out of the womb, I think, right? Uh, to, to I, th I, think, I think maybe, but to be completely honest with you, I think it's all relative because, you know, whenever I read into my, my heroes, meaning mm -hmm. Amadeus Mozart or Ludwig von Beethoven, they make me feel awful because you look at what they were doing when they were five, six, <laughs> seven, eight, they were touring around Austria and they were writing symphonies and operas. So I do think it's it's all relative. I I've, I've had a really interesting life so far, and have been able to you know like you do what I love doing every day, which is always just mm -hmm. such a pleasure. But yeah. um, no, I, I definitely I definitely think it's all the way that you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but yeah, right. still impressive and uh, amazing what you what you have accomplished already, and I, you have a very bright future ahead of you. I'm I'm hundred percent. I mean. Yeah, this actually leads me to my first question. I mean, if you would, if you needed to stop now what you're doing, whatever you're doing, um, and didn't have more time, um, and you would leave a legacy for, you don't have kids yet, but if you had, um, would this be the point where you said, okay, this is the legacy I would have, that I would like to leave, or is there something else you would have done differently? Yeah, it's interesting because I was just reading this amazing interview with, um, again, one of my heroes, Martin Scorsese, and they interviewed him. You know, he's about to release, you know, one of his films, The Killers of the Flower Moon with DiCaprio, and it's going to be a big release. And they interviewed him and they said, you know, Mr. Scorsese, like you've been making films for decades and decades and decades. Um, and he says, you know, somebody once told me that there'd be a day where just as you're finishing your career, you feel like you're ready to get started. So there's so many stories you want to tell and there's only so much time to tell it. I feel like for me, if my life is a marathon and my, my catalog of work is a marathon, I haven't even passed the first mile marker um, in terms of <laughs> the amount nice. of the amount of stories, the amount of energy, the amount of things that are sort of built up in me that I'm just so excited to explore and, and release. I think that's, that's really what gets me excited, you know, and um, so, something that again, Matthew McConaughey once said, which I loved so much. I saw it when he did the ex uh, acceptance for his Oscar. And he said, my goal is always myself 10 years from now. So whenever I think about, you know, um, 
you know, uh, is there a time when I'm going to be satisfied with myself or satisfied with my work? That's like never, because it's always 10 years ahead. Right. And when you get there, it's going to be another 10 years. So that's the way that I like to look at it. Yes. So, I mean, this entrepreneurial or creative journey is always like this, right? You, you come to a point where you think, okay, now you have, you accomplished this goal that you had 10 years ago or like five or a year ago. And then all of a sudden you're on the next thing and you, you look, I mean, we have as a creator, we have to look in the future, right? We have to see what comes next and what, what are this, the desires of our hearts to, to uh, accomplish this. And this entrepreneurship is very, um, has also some ups and downs, right? And yeah. um, are there any, any, um, I mean, do you have anything that you would have done differently when you look back on the, on your, on your life and on your um, creations that you, that you did, or are you just good with everything that you did? Yeah, I definitely was not right off the bat good with everything that I did. And, you know, um, <laughs> something that I've, I've really, over the years have really felt really passionate about is, is MIDI programming and virtual instruments and production. Um, so getting as good as I possibly can at, at programming an orchestra and uh, I'm able to do it quickly and efficiently and, and all that kind of stuff. And honestly, it's a, it's, a, it's a process of continuous failure and then learning from those failures. And um, I, I, think, I think that's the thing. It's like, I think there's nothing I could tell myself 10 years ago that would help me because in a way, all of us, it's a process of discovery. Every, every time we're getting better at something or we're trying to improve in something, it's a process of trying, failing, succeeding, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. And every mm -hmm. single time you, you go through the process of, of writing a score or making a film, hopefully when you get to the other side, you know, you have gotten just that much better at it. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what I would, if I was able to tell myself, you know, when I was, let's see, 15, 16, when I was getting into scoring, um, I would just tell myself, like, just be open, say yes, um, and always be inquisitive. Uh, don't, don't be afraid of reaching out to people and asking to right. meet for a coffee or, you know what I mean? Just really enjoying the community of people. Um, cause in the end, it's all about. It's all about the relationships we build and that's really, you know, where it all starts. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you spend your time very much like, as I see it on your website in any way, very much on the documentary filming side more, or is it, do you like have like certain like times we just do scoring or certain times you just make music for yourself or um, prepare for, for a film or do you do it all at the same time? Or is this like, how, how does, how does your like normal year or day is probably too short of a time frame, but um, how does, how, what, what does this look like if you do all these things at the same time and bringing out all these great, yeah. like, you know, you're not doing um, like, crappy movies or series it's like it's um high profile and high um the content is great and the, the also the production is great and then you have like people scoring for you that other people would dream have them score for your films so how, how do you how do you manage that well i think it's it goes back to i was um meeting with someone a few weeks ago and they say well are you a composer are you a filmmaker are you a documentarian like how exactly do I categorize it? And I think as a whole, I'm just, I love film and I love, I love storytelling and music, film scoring fits into that, making documentaries fits into that. I also just happen to really love um, history as well. I love, um, you know, I'm just a total, I guess the right word to use as a nerd when it comes to um, sort of exploring history and yeah. reading biographies and looking through the evolution uh, of everything. And that's what got me interested in documentary film. Cause I realized, oh my gosh, like I could, I could go out and meet with people and interview them and put together these films and, and tell stories that I feel are important. And in the end, I'm basically doing the same thing that, that I'm doing as a composer, but it's just a totally different medium. 
And the one great thing about documentaries is that it combines all, all forms of media into it. You have mm -hmm. um, the process of research, the process of writing, the process of editing, of filming, of interviewing. Um, so it combines it all together. But if, if I had to say it, I would say I'm sort of split down the middle in terms of my, my love and passion for, for scoring to picture and, and, and writing music as a composer, and then also um, putting films together. And so like right now, recently, um, I've been working on this eight part uh, documentary series called Kennedy, all about the life yeah. of JFK. And I've been working on that for three years from, from researching, writing, producing, directing, um, and then of course, putting together the, uh, the series in post-production. So doing the editing and the, um, and the music as well with uh, two other composers. So it's, it's a laborsome <laughs> sort of task, but, um, I would say that's that, that's the best way I could describe it. I'm sort of constantly going between different different forms of, of media, uh, and I just love every aspect of it. So yeah. it's always interesting. Yeah. That's interesting because you hear a lot of business experts or people talk about you have to focus and you have to niche down and you have to do like the one thing and there's you, you cannot be multitasking is not possible. But it seems for you it is. I mean. This is, um, I, I mean, some people just work on a film and are overwhelmed and you do not only like directing, but you do all the other like post and then the music as well. And how I'm, I'm just r trying to wrap my head around this. <laughs> how I, I would say, I would say the key, the key is, you know, somebody told me this when I was starting out my work in film, surround mm -hmm. yourself with people that, that know more than you in their fields and mm -hmm. that bring everything that they have to the project so luckily in the films that i've directed um i've been able to surround myself with really great cinematographers and camera ops and um producing partners uh so for example on kennedy uh, i collaborated with dave Sorelnik and john Kamen, who are these two amazing uh producers based in new york at radical media and they've been able to help get the series you know find the series at home And, um, so I, I would say that it really, it's, it's just like I was saying before, building relationships and finding other people that love the things that you do and working together and collaborating. And, uh, and of course there's no such thing too, as multitasking. There's only such thing as rapidly going between d different tasks right. at the same time. So your, right. your brain sort of has to be on a constant level of just energy, just going between one and the other and the other. And not being held back in any one. So always moving forward if you can. Mm -hmm. And what, what would you tell someone that wanted to start either filmmaking document documentaries or um, f music composition? What should they focus on? Like if they, I mean, you, you were employed by probably the, the most sought after um music production house in the world um at, at least in the media composition field um and i mean what 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 would be the first step for someone who wants to be there to i mean not everyone wants to be at remote control or at beating fingers but this is like um at least when it comes to quality and to um like she output is one of yeah. the like leading um companies in the world for sure or if not the best i'm not sure but um what would be the first step what should someone focus on to get to the point that they would be asked by hans timmer to work for them well i would think it's it's really it's two it's three things first of all is of course just constantly putting stuff out there and even if i think hans, hans said this at one point but it's writing something every day so, so finding some way that you can have a straightforward trajectory where you're just following, you're writing every day and you're trying to get better, you're trying to improve and learn. I would say that's the biggest thing out of all of them. And then, of course, there's people and there's relationships and trying your best to, I mean, some of the best times I've ever had in my life in the music world is when I go to some of these, you know, international workshops and I, you know, I went to um, Baden, Austria and mm -hmm went to the Hollywood Music Workshop and met people from Italy and, and China and, and uh, all over the world. And there's nothing like meeting other people 
and picking their brain, learning about them, learning about their lives, about their techniques. And um, I, I would say that's just a huge part of it. And that's also mm-hmm. how, if you're a film composer, you'll meet directors and you'll meet producers. And then, of course, if you're a filmmaker, that's how you um, get a film made is spending time with investors, investing the film, getting the money to make the film, uh, work, working to pitch to studios. It's all about those interpersonal relationships. That's such a key. Um, and then for music specifically, I would say the production aspect is nowadays just such a big part of it. And I remember I was 15. I would think I was 15 or 16. And I was in LA for the first time. And I had the opportunity to, to go to, the, to Harry Gregson Williams' studio and just sit in for an hour or so and watch him work. And the one thing that I noticed even then was his just unbelievable production chops in terms mm-hmm. of programming, all things that he learned from Hans. And then, of course, has learned over the years of you know, scoring dozens of projects. But he just had such an attention to detail for programming, um, you know, using modulation, expression, the way that he played it in and, and worked to the picture, which is in front of him on this huge, huge screen. Mm-hmm. So I would say that production is just such a key part of, um, of being a composer in film and media nowadays, because directors and producers, they want to hear what it's going to sound like. And if not, what it's going to sound like with a live orchestra, what it's going to sound like, period, because you might not have the budget to record with an orchestra. Right. So and, I think that's, that's really it. Yeah. And there's, I mean, they are so used to it, to have it sound like real, even though it's not real. Like, I think this is probably, that's a very, very good point. The production side of things and the attention to detail. If I sometimes get um, demos back from, from my world, like the commercials and, and stuff like that, it's like, um, yeah. I mean, it sounds good, but it's not good enough. And I think this the the production side of things, yeah, really hit a point there. Yeah, and, and I I, th- I think there's there's something in in film scoring where it's sort of like an an equilibrium of all of these elements coming together that form, you know, a like like a, a lot of the composers that I really love nowadays, whether it's Benjamin Wallfish or um, or Harry or Despla or Elfman. They're all, they somehow have found this, this level where they're incredible composers, where they've trained just to, to be able to write music masterfully. Then they're solid programmers that can put together demos. And then of course they're mm-hmm. people, people. So they have gotten to know these directors and are really good at the, the art of schmoozing and, and building these relationships and having directors come and sit in and communicating. So I think that all of these composers that we look at in a way are able to find something of a, of that mixture of all of those elements coming together. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and that's really, that's really it. That's really it. And I mean, the cool thing is it's hope for everyone because they are like older than us. Um, Some of them more older than others, but, um, or younger, but still there's time to, to learn these things, but to have, you have to be aware. And this is why it's great that you said that, that it has to be a mixture, mixture of like the, the composition production and people skills to be actually successful as a composer. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to just there's sh- for it to be just talk and there's nothing behind it. It doesn't work. And if there's good, great music, but you're not, you're not able to sell it in a, in a way, or you're not able to like um, connect with uh, your clients in this in this part. It's directors um, in a way that they have confidence in you that you can actually put the final touches, or even I would say fifty percent, make their film fifty percent better through your music. Yeah. Then it's um, almost impossible to get someone to work with you. I think. Yeah, and there is, there is an aspect which I think is so interesting about film scoring where composers also sort of double as psychologists in a way. Because when you're sitting there with a director, and you know this as well from, from working with libraries or whoever else is giving you notes on things, mm-hmm. some of the notes sometimes are very odd and psychological. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. you know, I want this to be more blue. Can you bring out the, the right. angst? Can you bring out the guilt? 
bring, bring in some of the, so in a way, I think that's really part of our job is, is, is finding paths to empathy of trying to connect with right. the characters, whether you like the characters or you hate the characters, finding empathy for them so that you're able to properly score the film and be open to it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have to reach deep into the character to be able to score it well. That's that's absolutely true if, if you hate them or love them. And I think what, what I always say is about my, my job is not making music, it's translating words into music. And I think this is... Um, and for every director and every production house and every brand, it's different, right? It's They have their own vocabulary to, to, ex, to explain music and it's really hard to put it in words. And as you said, it has, there's a psychological aspect to this. We have to basically um, decipher what they're trying to say and what they want into hearable, audible, a nice uh, sounding or perfect sounding music, right? So this is the job yeah. um, of a of and, a, and composer. Yeah, you, you say it, you say it so well, and I think also it's it's finding the subtext of the film or uh, that you're working on. Like one of my favorite examples of this is of course um, Interstellar, which is, is still mm -hmm. to this day, I would say um, aside from Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, my favorite score of all time. So it's, it's up there in my top five. Yeah. And the reason why it works so well is because the organ is the largest man-made instrument that man has ever produced. Mm -hmm. And Interstellar is all about these vast, you know, it's, it's about the interconnectedness of, of humanity in space and time. Mm -hmm. And in order to properly capture that weight of, you know, it, you know, in the film, how love is able to stretch across, you know, these galaxies. Yeah. And so he uses this, the largest instrument that humankind has ever made to sort of be the voice of that, which of course is the organ. And this is something that, I'm sure Christopher Nolan didn't just reach out to Hans and say, hey, you really ought to use an organ. I don't think it was like that. I think it was a process of discovery and really trying to look under, under the surface of it and find out what works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ba basically something like, find me, uh, I need a score. I mean, I don't know how they, how they actually talk together, but find me, uh, make us, the music has to sound vast and has to span over like, centuries and and time and then hans masterfully of course translated translates this with an organ which probably i haven't seen a film composer do this before so yeah as as, as many times before he invented something for film music that was not there before so yeah that's that's very interesting to 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 hear this This example is really, really good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is so um, unique. It's and it's yeah. still every single time. Every time I see the film, it, it's just as powerful as it was mm -hmm. the first time I saw it when I was thirteen, thirteen right. or fourteen. Um, so just an amazing score. Yeah, absolutely. So, since you are multi-talented and um, like excel in all these categories, um, tell me especially for, for music, when was a point in your life that you knew, okay, you wanted to do music? How, how did this come about? So I started playing music when I was seven. I was sort of a lost mm -hmm. child in that up until I was seven or eight, I had absolutely, <laughs> of course, like most people, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, and I was just sort of hopping around and um, just... I clearly had not found anything that I liked doing. And I remember one time we went to a music store and I saw a guitar and just the way that the guitar was built with the neck mm -hmm. and with the strings, I just fell in love with the, the image of the guitar. And we bought Guitar Hero, the game. <laughs> and oh, so nice. of course <laughs> I started playing awesome. the game and, and falling in love with all this great <laughs> classic rock music. Um, these great bands. And then that Christmas, I got my first guitar and it was just off mm -hmm. from there. So I started out playing oh, guitar man. and then I took lessons and drums and, and formed my first band when I was 12 <laughs> and recorded our album uh, when I was 13, 14. And we were playing gigs all over. And um, 
And I really got my start as a live musician playing live in bars and parties and yeah. events. And then of course, in late 2014, I was at a movie and the movie was called The Imitation Game, uh, which is a great film starring Benedict Cumberbatch and music by um, Alexandre Desplat, the French composer. And I remember at the ending of the film, for some reason, I just started breaking down like in tears. Like I, something about that ending of the film where it tells you what happened to Alan Turing after the war. Mm -hmm. And then of course his legacy where he ended up creating in a way the first computer. I mean, he has this amazing legacy. And then the score has, it was something I had just never up to that point fully appreciated in a film while in a movie theater. And the first thing I did when I left the theater was, of course, research who is this guy, Alexandre Desplat? Like, who, what does he do? <laughs> I didn't even know what a film composer was. I didn't even know how all that worked. And so immediately, that's when I got into film scoring. And I started taking composition lessons and reading every orchestration book and composition book. And um, <laughs> that's how it started. Wow. You know, yeah. and then it's, up until now, I mean, that, that was really the origin of everything. Amazingly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the tr how did it, I mean, you were obviously interested in films before you were interested in film scoring, which most of us are because we films are more, um, upfront, right? You see them in theaters and stuff like the music in the films is not that obvious. Or at least it shouldn't be, or sometimes it has to be, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, how did this come about then? So you you went to the theater, you, you thought, okay, I have to learn how this is done. Who is Who are these guys? What are they doing? And then how did it go to um, filmmaking? Did this has to, did it, did it, was it a different line or was it just like, okay, I want to do everything? You know, it was one of those things where, you know, at the time I started making films, which was in the beginning of 2019 was the first feature film that I started working on. But I started making short films from the time I was 14, just really bad short films with my old camera and my iPod touch. And I would go out in the forest and then I got a DSLR camera and I was making little short films with my friends. And so that whole idea of being able to you know, film something and then edit it and put it together and tell a story was something I always loved doing. But in 2019, you know, my great uncle had passed away, who was, who was one of the American liberators of the Buchenwald concentration camp. Oh, wow. And so I grew up with this, this amazing sense of history. And I realized, you know what, I, I love film. I love history. I love storytelling. I really want to, to, to make a film. And the subject that, again, always was on my mind was World War II and all of that. So I went out and spent eight, nine months away from music and went fully into the documentary space. So that included going out, renting a camera, going to Poland, interviewing people around the country. And at that point, you know, you know this, anyone else knows this, that has really fallen in love with anything. It, it's just an instant moment. Uh, mm -hmm. during that process when I was like, this is, this is absolutely a dream come true, being able to do this as a job and make films. And um, so that was really when the transition happened. I'd started scoring for film in probably 2015, 2016. And then in 2019 is when I transitioned into the documentary world. And mm -hmm. I think in the future too, it, it won't be just documentary. I have all sorts of right. ideas for, for scripted material as well. So th that'll all be stuff that I'll be interested in exploring. I mean, I can't imagine you just doing one thing. <laughs> With 22 years, you did all this stuff. I mean, you will probably always find something new to to do. do. Yeah, that's uh, that's impressive. Yeah, really, really cool. I mean, how, um, so your connection to to World War II comes through your great uncle, uncle, as you said, and yeah, um, then. Buchenwald, of course, this horrible time in history in Germany or in worldwide, basically, um, is um, how how did this? Have, are you are you um, um, otherwise connected to to this history, or is it just 
through your uncle? Well, it's, it's interesting because my, my father's side of my family is Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I grew up, you know, of course, learning about that, learning about Jewish history and learning a little bit about my heritage. And I knew that my blood, you know, had, had come from Eastern Europe, which of course was the most heavily hit part of the Holocaust yeah. by, by far when you look at um, Poland and then of course Lithuania and all of those other territories over there. But I think when I was making that, fil that film, when I was making that film, um, We Shall Not Die Now, I had this mm -hmm. sort of awakening where I was all of a sudden by myself in front of the gates of Auschwitz and I was in Krakow, Poland, and I was there where these people lived. And of course, um, in the case of Auschwitz and Treblinka, where they perished. And I think like it does something to you when you're actually at these places that you can't really get from a history book or from a documentary. And that was also one of the things that sort of cemented my passion for, for, for telling stories in film and documentaries is that I figured out that I could sort of transport people to these places yeah. and to these times and tell these stories that for me are really powerful and have really uh, established who we are and who are, what our world is now. And so when that first film was, was done, that was really the beginning. But I think I, I connected so much more with my, with my heritage, my Jewish heritage, of course, through that mm -hmm. film. And then of course, just with world history and contextualizing it and how important World War II was for even where we are now in history. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? How, how do you think it's important? I'm just curious. What, what yeah. your thoughts on it? Because yeah, I mean, I have this heritage well, as a German, so yeah. I'm, it's yes. Well, it's a, it's a great question. It's a great question, and I think it's it's something that you know Eisenhower actually said when he went into one of these camps and he was he was liberating one of these camps, and he said, you know, mark my word, there will be people in decades to come or in years to come who will try to deny that this ever happened. So take mm -hmm. your pictures, document it, because. And so I think that it goes back to that central idea to where if we don't remember history, it's doomed to repeat itself. And of mm -hmm. course, since the Holocaust, we've had genocides in Rwanda. Right. We've had genocides in the Vietnam War. We've had genocides in Cambodia, um, in, in the Soviet Union under Stalin, just unbelievable loss of life. Mm -hmm. And so basically, if we don't reflect on these moments, if we don't look back, and figure out how did it happen, then it's doomed to repeat itself. Because yeah. something like the Holocaust is not something that happens overnight. It is a long uh, process that includes a whole bureaucracy of people from all walks of life that leads to this stuff happening. So when I look at what's happening in Russia, for example, where you have the head of a country who is his ego and his, his sense of utter um lack of empathy is just so strong and he could care less what people are dying in ukraine he could care less because he knows what he wants and he wants the territory of ukraine and he's going to do whatever he can to get it so when i look at that i mean i see so many through lines and so many to history and i think that's why we study history and that's why world yeah. war ii is relevant yeah Okay, yeah, that's that's a good point. Absolutely, what I find interesting in in our time now, that how think things are portrayed. I mean, they were always portrayed um, somehow in a way that was good for either one or the other side or for the third side or whatever. But these days, it's so fast that media or people can like give their opinion and everyone knows it like big big media networks and i think this is also um what it makes so interesting in these day in these times that as um you have to be because it's so fast and there's no time in between something happening and something you see in the news uh, if you watch news i don't or i mean for most people facebook is the news channel at these days yeah. but um <laughs> Um, you have to be, that, that is think, what's interesting, by the way, is that the more you look at history, the more you realize we're actually living in, we're really living in history, which is why I love so yeah. much following, 
following world events, whether it's wars or whether it's mm -hmm. coronations or or any of this kind of stuff is because you, you really get a sense of, of where we are in the scheme of history. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even the world that we have today, Russia as it is, it was built based on what happened in World War II. And then of course, World War II, Russia was based on what happened in World War I. And all of this stuff is interlinked together, which is just so interesting, right. even to this day. I just find it yeah. fascinating. That, that's fascinating, absolutely. And I, I, what I wanted to say about the media is like, you have to be careful these days of what you're actually looking at and what you, what, what's the truth and what is um, just a hunch of a news, news uh, cast or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's just, it's very interesting um, to see how fast the um, things spread these days and how, what kind of information you um, deem true or false right so this is and i mean i know or i i believe i don't know but i believe that um at the time of of the beginning of world war ii when when hitler came to to become the reich president in 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 germany and and took over um he had his his way with like getting people to believe that his uh, work will be um, the good work, right? So it's, otherwise, no, right. n no one would have bought in if he said, oh, "I want just want to kill Jews or people yeah. that don't like me." Um, yeah. He he said things that um, made people believe that he will change at a very very uh, tragic moment in time in Germany, where, where like the um, inflation was so high and everyone was starving. Um, he made the promises that people wanted to hear. He was a very great, a very good politician. Let's say it this way. Yes. And of and course, very, is, very evil. Yeah. Yes, but that is, that is such a key to understanding these moments in history that are so evil and so unfathomable is we have to look at these people as people. We can't look at them as monsters because if we do that, we don't serve. I mean, in order to fully comprehend what humankind can do, We have to look at these people, even the most evil, as people, because in the end, you know, they they were people who were making really horrendous decisions and actions. And then, of course, you have to look at how these things happen. And, you know, in the case of World War II, as you're saying, you know, it's, it went all the way back to World War I and right. the, the Treaty of Versailles exactly. having been written and breaking apart Germany in the post-World War I era. And then, of course, Hitler is someone that understood people and he understood scapegoats and he understood uh, and he was someone who was broken in the end. If you look at his life right. and the, the time that he spent in Vienna after his, his, his parents died and he brought all of that out and, of course, utilized really well done speech and um, campaigned like anyone else, went around Germany, spoke to people. And over time, it It, it built up. And then, of course, mm -hmm. as you say, there was the switch where it went from, you know, not just trying to bring Germany out of a recession and trying to provide people with food, but of course, trying to kill its enemies. And that's really where right. that starts. Right, exactly. I mean, I heard someone say the other day that um, our enemies are not the, are not the people, right? It's it's if I if I see Hitler as the enemy, I mean in in the end he was the the um, image of the enemy, of course, and had to be um, taken down. But I also think that with every person that's that's walking the earth at this at this moment, it's it's a chain of decisions that we make that makes makes us a good person or a bad person. I think, and so. If you look at Hitler, he was very, very, very talented, right? He had like, he has, was a brilliant mind, but he used it for the wrong, for the wrong things. So I think that's, is, exact, that's I mean, exactly I, it. Yeah. I'm not at all saying Hitler was, um, we should have not, right. uh, Hitler, Hitler was good or something. I'm just saying he made a decision at some point through whatever things happened to him or things that got into his mind or heart or whatever, um, that he wanted to do this 
because he was greedy and well, evil and or became yeah, and, greedy and evil. And it's it's one of those things. I've I've read a you know a two volume, probably more than a thousand pages biography of of Hitler. And the mm -hmm. one thing that you really come to realize is the fact. I mean, he was fully prepared to turn all of Europe into a slave state. He was prepared mm -hmm. to turn these occupied territories into fully operate and, of course, to liquidate the enemies. So he had this ideology of continuing to push into other territories, make Germany bigger and better, and then, of course, to eradicate the enemies, which included Jews, and it also included right. other people, whether it's ethnic Poles, whether it's uh, gay people, whether it's, uh, you know, so all of right. these other things. And so I think that you're absolutely right. In order to look at history properly, we need to fully look at it three-dimensionally. We need to understand how someone like this could have come about. We need to look at, of course, we need to look at the bureaucracy of how the Holocaust happened, all of the people that were involved from Hitler down. Right. It was Hitler, it was Himmler, it was Goering, it was the commandants of the camps, it was the the people in the, the Wehrmacht who were on the... So all of these things, and that's why I love, you know, documentaries is because you're, you're out there in the exactly. field speaking with experts, you're, you're on site at these places, you're in the mm -hmm. archive and you're trying to put together all of these puzzle pieces. And it's very much, it, it's, it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's always, it's super enlightening and interesting. Right. Right. Yeah. I wanted to add one thing to what you just said, that the whole apparatus that made this possible he was enabled to do this right he was imprisoned in munich and has written his book mein kampf in prison right. and was able to distribute it through the channels in the they, the people that worked in the prison knew what he was going to do but they still let yeah. him out so um there's and always course, two and of course right? when the time comes for mm -hmm. him to speak to the the lawmakers as as it goes you know to make the decision on when he was going to leave prison, yeah. when he was in prison there in Munich, of course, he gives this like three hour speech and uses right. words, <laughs> uses words to seduce and to manipulate right. like any good sociopath, psych psychopathic person does, which is understanding how words translates to other people. Right. And so I think that when you look at that and then you go forward and you look at somebody like For example, let's look at somebody like Putin, who runs a totalitarian regime in Russia. Um, and as we know, he has committed war crimes in the territory of Ukraine. We have evidence of it. We have photographs of it. And it's a, it's a difficult time. And it's always important to differentiate one person from another, one period of history from another. But of course, history doesn't repeat itself. It rhymes. So I see these, these rhyming aspects of the destruction of the press, the destruction of free speech, all of this stuff that you saw back then in World War II, you've seen in many other totalitarian regimes. And then, of course, you've seen it recently with what Putin is doing in the government in Russia. So mm -hmm. it's all of this big through line. Everything connects you know, right. together. But, you know, there's always two sides. So he, for him, the West is his enemy. And he says exactly the same things we are saying, but from the other side. So this is always, and it, it's for, for, for me, it's hard to th look through all this and say with clarity and with like a hundred percent certainty, he is wrong and he is right, or they are wrong and they are right, because I don't have all the details. I only have the details that the media, the politicians that are also very good liars most of the time, um, tell you to get their stuff done, right? So well, I, mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think everybody can agree that the one thing that has to stop is, is people dying. And I think that's 100%. people, on, that's people everything that we need side. to do. It's these young Russian kids who are going out there who have no idea what they're, what they're fighting for. I mean, they don't, right. what, what, what is going on here? And then of mm -hmm. course, I mean, it's people from both sides. And I think that's what we really want is we want people to, to you know, to live good lives and not, be killed in these horrifying bombing raids that are that are happening in period yeah. so um 
but again, that, that is why we reflect on history. It's why right. certainly I love um, exploring history in my films mm -hmm. is because you really begin to see how all of it uh, relates to our world today. And, and yeah, when you do that, you look at the world through a different lens in a way. Right. Right. And this is also what makes us exactly what makes us look at the world in a different light. If you look back and also brings about what the world is today, right? It, 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 it doesn't happen in an instant and in a blink of an eye, it just happens over time. And this is where we are right now. And all of, I mean, I'm, so I think Germans have put a lot of, um, um, how do you say it? What's the word? I don't know. Well, what, they, what, what, they, yeah. So as the, they have made big mistakes and they put a lot of, um, huh, I can't remember the word. doesn't matter. I, I, I feel I, like. I think that Germany out of any country in the world has possibly done the best at remembrance of World War II. Uh -huh. And they, uh, if you look at the education system in Germany, if yeah. you look at what they've done by installing thousands of memorials throughout Germany and working to preserve sites. And of course, right. um, I think they've done a really remarkable job in terms of trying to remember and trying to mm -hmm. reflect. Yeah. And, you know, I've spoken to some people that grew up in Germany and World War II is such a strong part of the education curriculum. Oh, and then I've spoken yeah. to people, I've spoken to people in other countries. I've spoken mm -hmm. to people in Poland, even where the Holocaust happened the extermination process happened in Poland and they didn't even know what Treblinka was, or they didn't wow. even know that 1 million Jews were killed at Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you're so right. Germany has done a very important job in remembering, but of course, yeah. moving forward in history. Yeah. So, I mean, you can hear my side of the story. I had history in, 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 in Germany in, in, in school and it was basically only Third Reich, right. and um, to the point where I think younger people in Germany, I mean, I don't know this generation now in, in school, but my generation for sure, they were always um, taught that we are bad people because Hitler did this. Mm -hmm. And I have to disagree because I had no say into anything like this. I mean, I don't know what I would have done at the time like this. But um, I, pr I mean, people would ha must have known. We, we drove through close to Berlin. Drove through um, the um, um, sites there and just looking for a house at at one point. And we drove by a not known small like concentration camp. Right. And there were houses directly next to it. So yeah. I think for people saying you didn't know it's just eh, i don't believe it i don't i i it's, it's impossible not to know at the time when it happened because there was like it was the smell then the screams then like like all this stuff like sh shootings and all this stuff so um but still i think i'm not responsible for this so you cannot tell me i am responsible and i have to feel bad about what happened right. i think the yeah. only tool that i and remember this great i i love that Germany does this, but what they didn't do, I don't, I'm not sure if they actually did it at some point that they actually said, sorry for what happened, mm. asking for forgiveness for the, from the Jewish people, because mm. this is something that could heal the wounds that are still there. And I sometimes feel they are still like, I mean, my granddad died, he was in the war and he didn't tell much because I think it was too much for him to talk about this stuff. He was um, shooting planes out of the sky with 16 um, so horrible, horrible scenarios for 16 year old kids. Right. But yeah, no, I, don't, is. I don't know. It, yeah, it is. So. I mean, and it's, again, it's, that's why it's so important to look at the three dimensionality of it. Um, yeah. you know, and, and look at how, again, it's, it's, it's an entire, and I think what's really interesting about what you were just saying is of course, all that we can really do is remember. And mm -hmm. I think I've spoken, I've had the chance to meet so many Holocaust survivors and people that were at all of these camps and of course just listen to hundreds of hours of testimony and, and, and speak to the historians. And the one thing that I think that the, that the survivors of it really care about is it being remembered. The, mm -hmm. the one thing that they're scared about is it 
continuing okay. to happen again and people forgetting uh, about these people that were killed. Mm-hmm. And I think that that, you know, again, the, the children of SS officers and their children's children, they weren't involved in, in the Holocaust. They, they, they weren't yeah. involved. And so all that we can do is just remember. And as long as we keep the memory alive, then I think we are doing something good. Mm-hmm. And it's the same for anywhere else in the world where something bad has happened. Hey, I live in right. America where we had one of the most destructive campaigns of, of extermination of the Native American population. Mm-hmm. And, and I call it extermination is because it was literally, if you look into the history of how an entire country of people, hundreds of nations of Native American tribes, and in the end, all of it was was shoved aside and people were relocated, people were killed, people were put on reservations. And even today, they do not receive the money, the resources that they need. Mm -hmm. And so I think all that we can do is really just remember it. And that's that's why we make the films. That's why we write the books. It's it's certainly why I do it. It's because I think it's just so important. That's really, really, uh, that's actually a very good point. Remembering, it's very good and it's very, very necessary and important to, to um, help things not happening in the same way again, yeah. even though they're still happening. <laughs> it's crazy, right? That we are still, we know this stuff and it's still happening. Well, yeah, and we have, we have actually seen the, the largest rise in worldwide anti-Semitism that we have seen in decades in decades. Um, and it's, it's sort of unbelievable. And, um, Again, there has never been a more important time to look back at history. There's never been a more important time. Yeah, yeah. So I think that all of what we've just talked about, you know, is just so key. Yeah, absolutely. To understanding our world today. 100%. I mean, yeah, I could talk for hours with you about this stuff because you know so much about it. And it's very um, um, cool to see that someone from the U.S. actually is interested in this history because when i when i lived in the us people sometimes ask me if, if hitler would still be uh, in in charge and i'm like um yep <laughs> okay i think we don't have to talk about this anymore um work you're doing is very important i really enjoy hearing that you take such an interest in um the history and especially in this part of the history with a lot of americans that i spoke to not a lot a lot but a couple of them still asked me if Hitler was still in charge, which is kind of weird. And I had to end the conversation pretty abruptly because it's like, how, how can I talk to you about this? But um, I want to hear from you. What, what are, where are people going to learn more about you? What, where would you send them to learn more about your work and what you do? So my website, my, it's just my name, ashtonglechman.com has all the info about me. And then my first film that I made about World War II um, we shall not die now is available on Amazon prime. Cool. And then, um, my current series Kennedy, which is eight episodes, eight hours. We just signed the distribution. It's going to be coming out this November internationally. Um, and I can't announce yet who it's going to be released okay. through, <laughs> but it, it will be released all over in different languages and everything else. So people will be able to watch that all around the world. Um, first on TV. And then of course it'll also be on VOD and streaming. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm also on social media. So I'm on Instagram and Facebook and everything else. And um, music's on, on both Apple music and Spotify as well. Awesome. I put all these links in the description also to, to the film in Amazon, on Amazon. Wow. And it was Thank such you. a pleasure to talk to you, man. Really interesting insights and thoughts, uh, uh, um, not only on the music side, but also on the history side. Really, really cool. Thank you very much for coming on. And well, I tell you, our, our, our entire experience discussing history just gives you a little bit of a window into what I'm like every day, which <laughs> this is this is the kind of conversations that I just I have all the time. So I love I love talking about it. And I'm so grateful that you uh, that you asked me to be here today. Uh, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Talk to you soon, man. Take care. Absolutely. Take care.